Turtles all the way down. I'm Jake, sometimes Jank. I'm going to talk uh, a little bit about and give a few examples of thought experiments today. Uh, Gedanken experiment. Uh, I remember coming across these uh, at a very young age, reading about people like Einstein, for example, who used to, you know, basically sit around and think about uh, some issues that could be uh, extrapolated and taken into uh, extreme versions to learn something. Uh, You know, for example, what happens when a... Someone is traveling at the speed of light going this way, and another person is traveling at the speed of light going the other way. What uh, what can we expect that to happen? And uh, of course, we can't. With a lot of these uh, experiments, uh, you know, actually do them in real life, but we can imagine them in our thoughts, and as a result, we learn a great deal about uh, how the universe works. Uh, and sometimes we're misled by them, and uh, sometimes they reveal paradoxes at the very heart and core of our nature and our understanding of of nature. And uh, it's also quite instructive to see how we try to escape from these paradoxes by, uh, you know, trying to explain our way out of them. Um, an interesting one uh, that I came across a while back was the the ship of Theseus, or Theseus, depending on which part of the Anglo-American uh, intellectual realm you're in. Uh, the story is of this uh, ancient Greek figure uh, by the name of Theseus who goes off on some kind of a successful expedition uh, to Crete and comes back in his ship and he's a hero and as a result of these his heroic actions the citizens of Athens decide to basically keep this ship in the harbor in Athens for centuries thereafter. And as a uh, kind of a tribute to him and uh, to his exploits, uh, they decide that the ship will remain there. And as each plank and oar uh, disintegrates or uh, weakens, they would they uh, take them and replace them. So over time, you can see how, you know, each and every piece becomes replaced by something new uh, that was not on those uh, trips with uh, Theseus. And uh, so the question then comes up, um, you know, what about that ship that we now have centuries later sitting in uh, Athens Harbor? Is it actually the ship of Theseus? Is it a replica? I mean, we, we replaced them piece by piece and we continued with each replacement to call that thing that ship by its name, and it continued to persist through time, uh, according to our understanding of it, uh, until each and every piece is replaced. So, you know, that's an interesting thing. We'll come back to this one. Uh, Many centuries later, probably a millennia or two later, Hobbes uh, says, well, let's take that, uh, Thomas Hobbes, says, let's take that uh, and and take it a little further, this thought experiment. And he asked, well, what if someone was actually uh, saving all of those pieces that were being taken out to be replaced and then reassembled them to create another ship of Theseus? And uh, so then another question comes up. Well, which one is the actual real ship? Is it the first one that he went on his adventures with, uh, the one that sat there... uh, you know, over over the years and was slowly replaced piece by piece? Or is it all of those original pieces reassembled into another ship? Um, you know, various versions of this uh, thought experiment uh, come up over the years. And uh, someone, in, someone like uh, Locke, uh, uh, another English philosopher, um, British philosopher, gave the example of a sock. You know, like, let's say you have a sock, it has a hole in it, uh, you patch it up, uh, another hole springs up, you patch that up, another hole springs up, and eventually you've replaced all of the fabric material in that sock with uh, different material, and but you still call it that same sock. So what is it about the identity of things that persist over time that, uh, you know, call upon us to call upon them by their names and their identities? So, you know, if you dig a little deep into this, you start to find that... Maybe things aren't as easily understood in common sense as they might first appear. Uh, there's also the story of this, uh, <clears throat> I guess, a family knife. Uh, you know, if, there, if there's a knife in which uh, that's been passed down by, uh, by generations and uh, the handle has been replaced, you know, a dozen times and the blade has been replaced a dozen times. But, uh, you know, ceremonially, everybody still uh, imbues this object with the identity and the importance of calling it what you've always called it throughout the generations. Take this a little bit further uh, into into our timeline and into the future. I mean, there's a lot of science fiction 
uh, stories that reveal some of this paradox as well. The one that uh, immediately jumps to mind is the transporter that you see in a lot of sci-fi stories like Star Trek, for example. And, and that, you know, opens up a lot of uh, pretty much the same can of worms here. Uh, so when you enter a transporter in Star Trek, uh, I, I'm not entirely sure exactly how it's supposed to work, but I, I think it can work one of two ways. Either it's disassembling every piece at some very... Uh, elementary level, you know, whether you consider that to be atomic or subatomic or what have you, and then transporting that uh, by whatever means to another space-time coordinate, maybe on another planet uh, somewhere, and that person then re uh, reappears on the surface of that other planet. Now, that seems to me a little bit risky. Like, what if the what if the transmission is corrupted? Uh, what if it doesn't go through? What if uh, so? Uh, it seems like the the safe thing to do would be to maybe make a copy of each of those uh, bits of information that uh, you know are supposed to uh, describe and exactly how, let's say, I'm made up, and then keep that copy kind of in buffer uh, until you get indication that it's arrived safely at that other place. And then, then what? What do you do with that buffered, saved set? Uh, well, <laughs> I guess practically that is then erased. And then the uh, version of me that arrived on the other planet continues as if nothing happened. I mean, I basically, I, I close my eyes. Uh, the transporter uh, figures out every piece of me keeps a, a copy of that uh, in buffer, sends me to another planet, then wipes out that buffer. But that original is essentially killed. So which one is the real me? Well, I mean, I don't know. Maybe we can come back to that as well. Uh, there's another movie um, called The Prestige, which kind of uh, touched on this as well. Uh, in that story, there are magicians that are working on I guess a way to do a magic trick uh, by moving a person from one side of the theater to another side of the theater. And they're using essentially transporter technology to, to do this. But they come across this tragic realization within the story in that in order for this to work, the person, the magician that's transported from one side to the other uh, continues in that new space where they were transported to. And the original is actually, <laughs> that is a bit of a spoiler alert, uh, but the original is actually drowned. And there's really the only way to do that, other than having multiple copies of you walking around, would be to do that. Now, so what is the identity of that uh, person? Let's say me, let's say they uh, do transport me to Mars, uh, but we don't uh, we don't eliminate the original. So now they've transported me to Mars. So I kind of wake up and here I am on Mars. And also here I am in the transporter and I wake up and I go, oh, I'm still here. I haven't been uh, moved to Mars. And both of those experiences are true. I mean, uh, you think of it as two, well, it's one entity. It splits into two, much like you might think, uh, you know, an amoeba uh, some uh, very small creature, uh, clones, essentially. So they have the same history. The me on Mars and me here have the same history up to that point. And after that point, there's kind of like a divergence, a split uh, between uh, the realities in that they're both real. They both uh, move along within their space-time causal universe uh, in kind of uh, independent ways or more independent. Uh, you know, there's some kind of entanglement probably is, is happening as well. <clears throat> so, you know, these are the kind of questions that, that start to come up as you, as you go deeper and deeper into these uh, technological innovations. And, uh, but it's not about the technology. It's really about how we see ourselves and what identity is and what it means to be you and me and uh, how do the, that differs from other people and also how that differs from you in the past. Am I the same Jake that I was 20 years ago? I'd say clearly not. I mean, there's a lot of difference, but obviously we had, uh, you know, up to that point 20 years ago, uh, Jake 20 years ago and Jake now, uh, we had the same 
history and timeline up to that point. And after that point, if you compare the two of us, uh, well, mine was able to develop for another 20 years, and this is what I became. That person is so different than me that you could probably say without, uh, you know, straining your credulity that it was a different person. And in fact, you could, you don't have to go 20 years away. Uh, I sometimes feel like I'm a different person from the morning uh, to after lunch and, uh, and in the evening and, and maybe even in a split second when something triggers you and you get angry, you essentially are, you know, by most accounts, a very different person. So, but, you know, we still call that, you know, that haze that uh, uh, of activity around me, my history, my, the things I've done and seen and my memories and, and, you know, put it all together. And we call that kind of a indeterminate haze. We call that Jake. I think of it kind of like a storm, you know, uh, it, it's kind of like, um, I don't know. Uh, when, when you, when you think, uh, I mean, these are examples you hear sometimes like, uh, if I'm dancing, I'm dancing. And then when I stop dancing, what happened to the dance? Where did it go? Did it exist? It was kind of a movement. It was a process. It was, uh, kind of a, a cyclone of activities, you know, something like a kiss when it's happening, it's happening. When it ha- stops happening, where did it go? Uh, these are all kind of like storms that are, in uh, some some important sense, self-generating, uh, in that they're kind of these loops of uh, interpretive activity uh, that are kind of swirling around in a whole bunch of processes, and uh, that whole collection over time, we call Jake, or we call you X. Now, uh, there's another uh, uh, <laughs> interesting thing that results from this. I remember somebody actually. Uh, actually tried this out in the courts. I think uh, there was a, someone owed money to somebody. So I think this is called a debt, debtor's uh, paradox. Uh, so let's say I owe you money. I, I borrow a uh, $1,000 from you today. And then next year you come back and you say, you know what, remember that $1,000 you borrowed from me last year? Could you pay that back, please? And, and I say to you, well, hold on a second. One year ago, uh, the person that borrowed from you, uh, and I can prove to you uh, all of these, you know, changes that have occurred, you can pretty much say that's a different person. I didn't borrow that. Jake from a year ago borrowed that. Now, that that obviously stretches, uh, and people don't seem to get away with that sort of thing, but uh, let's take it a little, little bit deeper. You know, I don't know what the actual numbers are in this, but I, I've heard some version of this understanding, and, and the way I first heard about it was that uh, that every seven years, for example, whatever that number is, each uh, cell in your body has been basically replaced by newer versions. Uh, you know, they disintegrated, they've been uh, swept into your system, they've been uh, recycled and cell- sent out, and new versions of these cells have been replaced. So maybe if I said, you know, if you gave me that debt, uh, if I borrowed that from you eight years ago, I can even with more force in my argument say, well, that wasn't me. And, and in fact, if you look at all of the cells in my body, I, none of them were even in common. So I didn't borrow that from you. And, and, and I think that's probably not going to work either. Taking it even further, I mean, from the cellular or atomic, you know, uh, I don't know, again, what those, uh, the length of time would be required for such things, but it's quite conceivable that all of the atoms uh, in your body can be replaced over time. Uh, and even at the subatomic level, you can say that, uh, you know, maybe even that at the subatomic level, you know, these particles are popping into existence and popping out of existence. And the net averaging effect of that is, uh, is you and it seems to persist over time. But really, it's a whole bunch of things that are just appearing and disappearing. And the total net effect of that is what we're seeing. So none of this which is me right now, was me even a few seconds ago. And uh, this all seems to make sense, but it doesn't seem to, uh, you know, follow through in our, in our legal and practical considerations, and uh, it probably shouldn't. You know, uh, this conversation that's coming up, we had uh, Karen Hamilton, who's a cognitive psychologist, so it was fun to actually uh, maybe think a little bit more about these things and, and uh, ask a few questions. Um, you know, I've been thinking more and more about, I mean, as a, a philosopher of sorts, I mean, these are the kind of things I've I've thought about for years, but, uh, they come and go from my obsessions over time. 
And uh, the last little while, I've been thinking a lot more about, you know, the self, how we understand it. And there's kind of a long history of uh, understanding the self in terms of a, uh, a multitude, you know, that uh, there's, there's a lot of history of, uh, of understanding the human mind as, uh, you know, maybe as component parts like, you know, a subconscious, a conscious, a, a superego, what have you. There's different ways to split it up. Some of the religious traditions, uh, the older traditions would call um, such things within you and they would call them demons, for example. And, um, you know, I, I tend to think in terms of, and I've probably mentioned this a few times in my uh, in the in the podcast episodes. I, I think in terms of storms or cyclones, or much like what we were just talking about, like a dance uh, or uh, you know a, a kind of a tornado of effects and processes that are going on within you. And uh, I think of them as multiple processes within me. So I have, um, well, you know, the, the, here's an interesting thing: when you you can actually s- split. Uh, the brain into two, you know, you've got a right brain and a left brain. And some very interesting uh, research has come out of this, where that has happened, the corpus callosum is split. And by all accounts, it looks like after that point, you actually have two separate entities within you that start to go on and function separately, more or less. And so it looked like up to that point, uh, if I was to split the corpus callosum, it's very much the same as if I was transported to another planet in the sense that up to that point, it seems like you've got basically two uh, gross entities within that have learned over the years to work together. So when you have an experience, you don't even notice, you know, much like when you're looking at something with your two eyes, close one of them, open the other one up and then, then reverse it. You see that you have two separate uh, perspectives that you're looking at, but when you have both your eyes open, your brain is actually just putting that all together. You don't even notice that, uh, you know, uh, I don't know, they call it parallax or something, you, that, that shift uh, of, of view. Uh, it looks pretty much like a singular experience to you. So that looks like what's happening within the brain in that you've got uh, essentially two very easily identifiable uh, parts of the brain that might, uh, in some sense, be said to reflect two entities within you. And uh, you don't notice that until it's split. And when it's split, you realize, oh, you know, they can actually go off on their own with their own ideas and decisions. And, uh, you know, left to their own devices, they might make uh, different decisions. And they will. And there's ways to experiment with this, you know, depending on uh, which eye is looking and which hands are being used. Uh, All kinds of different results happen. Now, I think there's more than two depending on how you slice it. I mean, an easy way to slice it is to chop your brain in half. And I mean, slice it in terms of uh, uh, abstractly. Uh, But I tend to think that there's, you know, there could be two or dozens or a few uh, different type of processes and cyclones and storms within you that are actively uh, working, most of them in the background, most of them that uh, don't come to the level of, of conscious realization, but somehow within us, within this giant storm of a system that is me, all of these storms are kind of, uh, they're kind of being nested into each other. They're overlapping. They're kind of like uh, uh, spinning Venn diagrams that are, that are overlap and nesting uh, to arrive at different results and motions. And, uh, uh, you know, you have essentially trillions of, of, of things moving around in, in certain ways. Some of them are within uh, that could be seen as smaller systems and uh, those systems are part of larger systems and those systems are part of larger systems. Eventually until you get, well, those systems are all part of like the left brain network and those other systems are a part of the right brain network. And depending on how much complexity there is in within one of these storms, within one of these cyclones, you can almost say that, oh, that's actually a separate entity. And in a way, I think this is how this this experience of having demons within you seems to uh, seems to come up. I mean, you have various uh, processes within you. Uh, I don't know. Maybe you could even uh, raise um, something like your desire for food or uh, sex drive or uh, you know what have you. You can call that as almost like a proto entity, uh, like a demon within you. That's kind of. Uh, uh, you know, urging you and pushing you, uh, you know, injecting their, uh, their, their position, their desires into the system while, so that the system can make the decision to go and do this or to do that. And you're putting it all together. And, 
you know, there are some people that, uh, like myself, for example, over the years, uh, gave a lot more prominence to maybe you'd call it the left brain systems, uh, systems that deal in a lot of abstract thoughts and uh, maybe take, uh, you know, the, this understanding to a meta level. And so you have the brain, fascinatingly enough, thinking about the brain, which uh, is, yeah, I would agree, one of the most mysterious things in the universe. And uh, and this is how I've come to understand uh, myself and others. And um, I think this there's a bit of a resurgence in this way of thinking, I like to think, or maybe I'm just uh, being exposed to a lot more of it because of the way uh, that I've been thinking about it. But uh, I think I'll talk more about this in, in, in future episodes. In the meantime, fun conversation with uh, Karen. Hope you enjoy it. Talk soon. Okay. You sound like a psychologist now. <laughs> About <laughs> well, to start like the experiment? Yeah. yeah. You're like, move now. <laughs> Don't move now. <laughs> so, do you carry out the experiments yourself? Are you engaging with these subjects directly? Um, or do you have, uh, like, assistants do that? Both. Yeah. I mean, as a grad student, I did a lot of testing. And also as a postdoc, especially uh, doing neuroimaging work, um, it's not really something you want to leave to just anybody, right? So, because yeah. um, to scan somebody in an MRI machine costs about $1,000. Really? It still costs that much? Yeah. Depending where you're yeah. scanning. But. Are people still waiting for months and months to have MRIs? Is that, uh, and does that get in the way of your research because it's... Uh, no, because uh, yeah. the <laughs> machines that I've used to scan people for research are separate from the MRI machines that are used for medical purposes. So I cannot hmm. really speak to what's going on in, in hospitals for yeah. uh, medical reasons. But <clears throat> yeah, ours are on research-dedicated machines. Well, that's yeah. good. And and your research tends to focus on aging, as you were saying earlier. Now, and I think I uh, kind of admitting that maybe for the first time in my life, those kind of issues are coming up as relevant <laughs> from my own personal experience. Uh, I'm what about, have you been noticing? <laughs> well, uh, well, first of all, there's the magic number. I'm about to turn fifty in a couple of months, and uh, and and whenever I had one of those milestone birthdays, it really made no difference to me. But for some reason, fifty seems like. Because I, I think back to when I was in my uh, 20s or younger, I would have thought 50 seems really old. Mm -hmm. uh, but these days it doesn't. Uh, are we changing in that respect or is it just the perceptions are changing? Are people actually more cognitively able as they get older these days? Is that? Well, that might be. Well, yeah. Hmm. Good question. I mean. There's certainly an increase in the number of people getting uh, dementia and Alzheimer's, the proportion of the population developing that, but that might be because people are living longer, mm -hmm. right? So yeah. um, I think attitudes towards aging are hopefully slowly changing as we have gotten rid of things like mandatory retirement age, I believe, mm. in Canada. Um, or they moved it up a couple of years. Or they've or moved it or, up. Yeah. I'm getting... Mixed around by, I know in the UK, they, they've yeah. gotten rid of it. Uh, it's a human rights issue, right? Like you should be able, as long as you're performing um, yeah, it's well kind of in your you job, then it yeah. seems strange to say you have to retire. Mm -hmm. um, so I think hopefully people's perceptions of aging are changing, but probably not fast enough. There's still mm. this view that, uh, you know, cognitively you're going to yeah. lose it, um, right. which isn't necessarily true. And the, another reason I'm thinking maybe more about it lately is that I'm noticing it in my in my father uh, mm. for the first time in the last couple of years. Um, you know, always one of the sharpest, smartest guys I, I ever I ever met. Mm -hmm. And I'm noticing, you know, certain uh, hiccups and failings in his uh, ability to recall things and to get confused and not follow things and, mm -hmm. and, and get lost uh, sometimes when we're walking around. How and old is he? He's uh, 78. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So in, in, <laughs> in a way, reasonable he, he's kind of like a running simulation for me. I'm thinking he's about 30 <laughs> years ahead. So I, <laughs> I know what Yeah, but as we were talking about earlier, you've yeah. had uh, different experiences in your life, probably right. different nutrition, different yeah. upbringing um, that might help you. Uh, you know, physical fitness is another big thing. Mm -hmm. um, maintaining 
your fitness level um, yeah. throughout your life really seems to be a preserving factor. So, yeah, so you might age, not go the same way. Right, right. <laughs> Which, you know, brings us to this kind of age old question of nature versus nurture type uh, questions that come up. And, and when you're doing all your, are you leaning towards, uh, is there, are you noticing a clear answer to what's in most cases most uh, prominent? Because I look at my dad, for example, and he did not really take care of himself. He smoked like two, three packs mm-hmm. of cigarettes a day, and, and, he, and he's still incredibly healthy environment. And I think, what the hell? You know, and you look at his, yeah. uh, his brother, and, uh, you know, I, I don't get it sometimes. Yeah. Mm. I know. My, my grandmother passed away recently, mm. um, and she was a big smoker, too, but she mm. lived till 90. Wow. And she kept using it as like, well, look at me. I <laughs> smoked and drank my whole life, and I'm fine. But I think that's a case study, or that's a, an instance of, uh, you know, one lucky. Yeah, yeah, that might be an outlier. If you mm. look at the general trend, um, we can tell you, you know, what sorts of health behaviors are probably for the best. Mm. Um but as far as the nature and nurture side of things go, mm. it's all, it's both, Obviously, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. That uh, Lothian birth cohort I was <clears throat> telling you about earlier where they have the, the um, mm. intelligence or the 11 plus data from these people mm. when they were young and now they look at them when they're older in Scotland and seeing how the degree to which their current IQ correlates with their early IQ and it's a very high correlation suggesting mm. that, you know, regardless of whatever path you take during your life, um, a lot of this might be genetically determined in that it didn't really matter uh, what, what you went on to do. But yeah, we know that that's not true, that there are certain yeah. things you can do. And uh, mm-hmm. you know that's on the one hand, but on the other hand, we know that if you have a higher education, a high sort of occupational complexity, like a challenging mm-hmm. job, mm-hmm. then you tend to show this sort of thing called cognitive reserve with age, where if you were going to get dementia or something like that, it will, it will onset later. You know, it you know, that staves makes sense, I off. guess, right? Yeah. yeah. Getting good use out of the, out of the system. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question I was getting at with this nature and nurture thing is, has anything uh, in the course of your research, have you found yourself leaning more one way than you thought you would have? Because I, I keep hearing uh, sometimes people... Uh, Maybe they're scientists, maybe they're philosophers on podcasts. It comes up every now and then where they say, well, I'm surprised that it's more nature than I thought it was. Mm-hmm. After, uh, you know, doing some research on it, they, they come to the conclusion that, it, uh, you know, maybe they thought it was 50-50, but it's a lot more uh, that you're born with some of these attributes. Or is it attributes? Is it abilities? What is it about a brain that makes it smarter than another brain? Like, mm-hmm. what's going on there? <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> I don't know if it's something I'm equipped to answer. <laughs> um, yeah, we still don't fully mm. know about that. Um, there's but still w- debates about what makes somebody more intelligent right. or even what is intelligence. Right. Yeah. Um, yeah. But you're measuring for it. So you're, you're, you're measuring, like when you do an IQ test or when you're doing your experiments, you can compare numerically intelligence in some level you know, yeah. to even compare longitudinally between that the subject them, themselves yeah so we're trying to put it numbers to it what, yes yeah you know, what are we measuring what is it? well that's mm. a good question mm. so um i guess my background or the theoretical view that i come from is that a big thing about well there's okay First of all, classically, there's this distinction between crystallized intelligence, which is your body of knowledge and all the things that you know, called crystallized because it's not really changing, mm. versus fluid intelligence, which is your sort of ability to adapt to new situations. I can give you some puzzles. You can solve the capacities them. Capacities versus uh, memories, I guess. Yeah, is or, sort okay. of, yeah. Okay. Mm. Um, and we know with age that crystallized sort of stays the same or even increases as you get older. You learn mm. more. Vocabulary tends to increase. World knowledge tends to increase, whereas fluid intelligence just does a nosedive. Mm. But also amongst people, I mean, obviously things can differ in the crystallized domain as well, but there's a lot of individual differences in fluid intelligence and what's mm-hmm. driving that. And I, I, my personal belief is that one thing that's really determining it is your ability to sort of focus your attention, um, block out irrelevant information, hmm. um, that, uh, yeah, these the kinds of tasks, paper and pencil tasks we give to people that theoretically measure this one thing, like problem mm-hmm. solving, it's made up of a whole... <clears throat> bunch of different cognitive abilities so it's sort of 
this, uh, oops, sorry, <laughs> it's sort of this uh, resultant uh, phenomenon, you know, mm-hmm. that we call your IQ, right. or your, your fluid intelligence, but really it might be drawing on your long-term memory, your working memory, your uh, yeah. top-down attentional control, all these different things going into it. I guess, uh, is there some way to measure uh, efficiency of a brain? I mean, res- is it the response or efficiency of, I don't know, logical efficiency? <laughs> is there a way? I mean, thinking of in terms yeah. of, a, of, a, of, a, of a system of information mm-hmm. that is pulsing around and there's information being exchanged at whatever level you want to call it, is it that one brain is moving faster or as smooth or maybe less resistance in the pathways uh, like how do you see it yeah it, i mean the yeah. the idea of efficiency seems to come up and that's mm. sort of a philosophical question that comes up in cognitive neuroscience in that um you hear that word thrown around when somebody's doing well on something on a task that you give them but they're showing less activation in the brain hmm. And so this might be an example, um, and it's funny, in, in the realm of aging, you know, if, mm. if young people are showing less activation and doing well, then people say, well, their brain is being more efficient. Mm. Um, if older adults are doing the same <laughs> thing, and then it's like, oh, well, they're just, <laughs> <They're losing. laughs> their brain's shot now. <laughs> just, they can't activate it as much, or, you know, it, mm. it's funny. Um, I think it's a hard um, thing to pin down, and as I was saying before, I think we still have a lot to learn about the brain and how it works, and so... Um, you'd have to have a very specific question and maybe be able mm. to fine tune mm-hmm. performance, look at different levels of challenge to the system and see how it responds to those different levels of challenge. And can it, right. uh, yeah, I guess. So what, what are you, what are you finding as, you, as you're studying aging and the cognitive abilities associated with, with aging? Um, is there some, you know, surprising thing that you found or is it, uh, is it, uh, I think what the, you expect? I think the most uh, surprising thing that we've found um, is this idea that older adults might actually be picking up on more information than young people. Mm -hmm. So um, in a situation like this where I'm talking to you and you're obviously my target Mm -hmm. information, I'm supposed to look at you and we're having a conversation, but behind you are all these paintings, which Mm -hmm. nobody can see because they're listening to us, (laughs) but just imagine it, there's all these paintings. And... Really, if I was really efficient at controlling the focus of my attention and, and maintaining mm. a focus on you and the conversation we're having, then I shouldn't pick up any of this information right. that's behind you right now. Mm. And that would be a sign of like, oh, I'm very intelligent mm. or I have a very good top-down control of my attention. Um, but what we find for older adults is that this is the maybe one of the prime abilities that changes with age, that hmm. you might hear this, that people become more distractible. It's harder for them hmm. to have a conversation in a loud environment, for instance, because they'll be more distracted by other So that's because they're picking up on those other bits yeah. more... Um more readily than, than a younger person? Is that? It's, yes. Huh. So that seems to be the okay. case. So, you know, we obviously have to do it in a controlled experiment um, where we're showing them, for instance, uh, pictures overlapped with irrelevant words and they're told to pay attention to the pictures and just respond when you see two of them repeat in a row. Hmm. But those irrelevant words, older adults encode them into memory. Hmm. And if we, over time, after a little break, test their memory of those words, not by saying, can you tell me the words that were there, but by giving them an implicit memory test. So Mm. we'll give them like a word stem, uh, which is the beginning part of a word and say, complete it in whatever way you Mm. want. They'd be more likely to complete those word stems using the distracting words they saw earlier. That seems counterintuitive to me. And, uh, because I, I would think that as I, in my, going back to, it's all about me, really. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> back to my personal Tell experience. Yeah. This is all just yeah. therapy, really. <laughs> it's just brief therapy yeah. for me. <laughs> no, uh, what was I saying? Uh, oh, there. Going forget. back to when you were younger, you were more distractible? Oh, no, think, oh, as I, real, I realize that as I get older, I'm better able to, I got better at being able to filter out useless information in a way that I'm more able to focus maybe, whereas I would be more... <clears throat> easily distracted when mm-hmm. I'm younger which is is that unusual or is that but is this in topics that you're you've become expert in you know when you're mm. reading something that's relevant to you and also you're not that old yet you're only 50 yeah. so mm-hmm. and this ability differs from person to person right. so 
um, yeah, I definitely feel that way since I was a child or even as a teenager that I became better able to focus on things. But this probably follows a U-shaped curve mm. that in children, if you've ever interacted <laughs> with a child, they're like, oh, what's that over there? Oh. You know, very distractible. Like a dog. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> and, it, and But you get better as your mm. frontal lobes develop right. and it goes up and now you can really focus on something. And maybe as you stop using those abilities or who, mm. who knows what the cause is, <clears throat> there is a lot of uh, loss of gray matter, white matter, particularly mm. in the frontal lobes with age, then mm. you might start to lose some of this control. And mm. while a lot of the time it might be detrimental to you that you're less able to do well on this fluid intelligence task mm. where I'm saying, I want you to just focus on this puzzle. Don't even look at those ones you were doing up there or mm. what's to come. Yeah. Maintain your focus on these ones. Uh, for older adults, that <clears throat> might be a particular challenge. And mm. so, but we're showing that, you know, in the, in so far as picking up on some of this information, I mean, it's difficult to say how mm. seeing that painting will be useful to me later on, yeah. but you never know. Mm -hmm. Or if I saw the solution to a problem at this point in time, and later I'm asked to come up with the correct answer to something. If what mm -hmm. I saw before was the correct answer, we show that older adults are outperforming young people in those hmm. cases. This kind of makes me think about uh, um, something that I've been thinking quite a bit about in terms of like when you're talking, you're sitting here, we're having a conversation that is abstract. I mean, it's, it's, it's words, it's at, the, it's at the layer of almost pure information. We're just, uh, you know, banding words back and forth. Mm -hmm. You're seeing a painting, you're not registering it abstractly in words but you're registering it somehow and mm -hmm. is there uh, do you see a sense in which there is some kind of processing going on in the background that you're not really accessing in a with your intellect but your what i like to think of it as like your body is processing it in a way mm -hmm. i call it that because it's somewhat unconscious in quotation marks uh I mean, is there another <laughs> entity inside you that's experiencing this that you then get access to at certain times, like when you're dreaming, for example, or in a psychedelic state? Or Maybe. I mean, uh, we, you know, I think that you'll see better what we call transfer or better evidence that somebody has knowledge of something if you keep the form the same. So mm. what we mean by that in psychology is usually like, don't change the font Mm. Or don't change the uh, spatial layout of the objects relative to each other or something. Mm -hmm. And that would suggest that maybe it's on a quite superficial level. Well, uh, or I would say it's not on the abstract uh, linguistic level, but it's on the more visual level. If, mm -hmm. if that's if it's more uh, you know sensitive to those kind of changes, um, yeah. yeah. I mean, we haven't um, done this a lot with auditory information, but I would assume that it would be the same but mm. but it's true that there might be that these things are you know you you are taking in more information than you could ever consciously process right. at one given point in time mm -hmm. but where is this information getting in and yeah. and does it provide like fodder for your dreams quite possibly yeah, um, yeah it seems to i mean yeah, yeah. Uh, and also when you talk about something like ptsd it seems like I mean, the way I've heard it described more recently is that it's more as if the body is, has imprinted this uh, response that continues. Mm -hmm. Even after your abstract uh, thinking of it has gone beyond that, the body doesn't get to the next stage of, uh, of recovery from that. Yeah, I mean, I think when you think about things like that, that there can be triggers that you're not even aware of or that there can be... Um yeah, even if you're trying to solve a problem, there's these findings of like incubation, right? That you, if you just stop thinking about it for a little while, then mm -hmm. the solution might come to you later on. And that does suggest that there's some sort of subconscious <clears throat> processing of information that, mm -hmm. that we aren't aware of. Um, but I don't know if older adults mm. do that more than young people. All we do know is that they seem to be taking in more mm. to begin with. Um, yeah. and also have a wider body of knowledge to begin with. And mm. um, this sort of like overflow of information or over availab availability of information might actually be what's driving things like memory decline in that mm. um, a single cue <clears throat> to me as a 35-year-old might remind me of X number of things, but to an older mm. doll, it might remind them of three times as much. And so, mm. and when all those different answers rush to the surface at the same time, you're less able to select a, a single one that you want to produce mm. at a given point in time. 
So, um, as you get older, uh, it seems like memory is something that obviously becomes an issue um, that it fails somewhat more as you get older. Um, and and <clears throat> I guess it seems that most of us seem to have a misconception of how memory works. Uh, I mean, a lot of people seem to think that it's kind of like a videotape mm -hmm. uh, that you just store it and then yeah. <laughs> you just recall it. But it's not that at all. No. And uh, how, how do you view memory? Uh, have you, <clears throat> I mean, like, is it episodic? Is that what they call it? Where you're Well, yeah. let, me, let me tell you how I heard it. Tell me yeah. if it makes sense. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the way I think about it is, and the uh, way it's been described, is that it's as if you have, uh, each time you recall a memory, that you're kind of putting a recipe back together. Mm -hmm. In that, uh, so that experience comes back, and it's related to the initial experience, and in that it's using the same kind of pathways, and very, and you know, it's going to be very close. But mm -hmm. it's not the same experience, obviously, because you're having it much later. Yeah. And as I understand it, each time that you recall that, the recipes put together slightly differently. And over time, even the actual physicality of the brain is changing. So that recipe will take on a different flavor each time that you recall it. So your substrate is changing as you go. And even if it wasn't, uh, the memory is, is being altered each time you, you bring it back. Is that... Yeah, I think yeah. that's a really uh, good analogy. The mm. recipe, you know, you might throw something else in there um, mm. and maybe it will stick because the next time you recall it, that's going to come back to you. Right. So you've added that little <clears throat> extra bit in that, that wasn't there to begin with. And that's where, you know, things like eyewitness testimony and, yeah. and the kind of interviews that um, witnesses have the first time they recall an experience to a police officer, for instance, is such mm. a critical important thing because any false information introduced to them at that point in time yeah. through no fault of their own gets incorporated into their memory and mm -hmm. misremembered later on. Right. Um, Yeah, the person I was working with at Harvard, uh, Dan Schachter, has a lot of, of work on this, and they have mm. something called like the constructive episodic theory. So, anyway, uh, sorry, that's my phone. <laughs> um, uh, he's phoning. He hears me talking. He hears me butchering his theory. No, but their view is that, yeah, that you do, you know, it's when you retrieve a memory, it is constructive, um, and that it, it serves a purpose, too, in that it allows you to imagine uh, future experiences as well mm. by, by bringing these different elements together. So, I mean, our memory serves a great purpose. It allows mm. us to imagine, you know, what if... What yeah. if I saw so and so um, on the last time we talked about this? Um, what if I what if I see them at this event? And like, given the context, we'll probably talk about blah yeah. blah blah, and allows you to prepare for things. Um, but again, it's also sort of malleable in some, yeah. in a way that you know it can become distorted very easily. That sounds like that's a crucial uh, thing to look at. It's it's almost like w even when you're doing a uh, when you're reconstructing that memory, mm -hmm. in a way you're creating a simulation. Mm -hmm. out of data in some sense mm -hmm. and uh when you're thinking about the future that's what you're doing you're creating a simulation right yeah. uh, you're okay what would it be like you know the example you give okay run simulation <laughs> yeah and you think it through and that might be yeah. why we have episodic memory in this mm -hmm. way or it might it might be why it, it you know one of the great purposes it's it serves or why we evolved to have this type of memory um you know, it might not be the case that all species have this same sort of ability to like right. reject themselves. <clears throat> Somebody, a uh, big memory person, Endel Tulving, who mm. is here at U of right. T. Yeah, he's a Toronto person. Yeah, he's right. a Toronto yeah. person, um, mm -hmm. has this I idea that, that it, you know, it gives you this um, auto noetic consciousness that allows mm. you to sort of like uh, project yourself in the future, into mm. the past, re experience things, imagine how things will be. Um, and that is really one of the primary functions of episodic memory because mm -hmm. there's other different kinds of memory, for instance, semantic memory, which is your uh, knowledge about the world. And these aren't really tied to, uh, you know, episodic is more like person, like what, where, and when did it mm. happen? Those kinds of memories of, yeah. of actual events as opposed to like, I know Paris is the capital of France, but I can't tell you where I learned that piece of information. Right. Yeah. You know, I sometimes hear there's a lot of uh, kind of hysteria about uh, artificial intelligence and, uh, you know, the singularity type folks where they're thinking about maybe someday encoding your own essence, your own being in some kind of a computerized uh, storage device to, to be yourself. Mm. The, this And maybe it comes from this Matrix type movie type thing where, yeah. uh, you know, where you just plug something in and you, you, you download 
you know, memories, um, uh-huh. that's not going to work, obviously. Uh, I don't think. I mean, can yeah. you can you input a memory into somebody? <laughs> I guess I'm getting a little... Not right now. <laughs> um, although I could see how, while well, we were just talking about yeah. uh, eyewitness, um, you know, mm. a misleading eyewitness interview mm. is almost doing that in a way. Right. I'm showing you a lineup of pictures of people I thought might have been there. Mm-hmm. I mean, no, it's not as cool as The Matrix, but, you know, you see those faces. And then when I come back to you later and show you a lineup, people will point to someone in, in the lineup yeah. and say, I saw them at the scene of the crime. And it's it's almost that way that I've implanted this idea in your head. You have mm. a familiarity for the face, and now you're misattributing it to the to mm. the event as opposed to the, the later event. Um, but... Yeah, I don't know about more complex memories. If you don't have that sense of seeing it from the first person perspective, then it might be a little bit difficult. Um, hmm. I don't know. Do you think about consciousness at all? <laughs> <laughs> I try not to. <laughs> Does that come up? Uh, not so much in what yeah. I do. I do know yeah. some people do study consciousness. It's really hard. It's the hard mm. problem, right? Yeah. So, <laughs> it's hard. Yeah, it's, it's too really hard. hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I, I mm. haven't studied consciousness much mm. myself, but mm. um, yeah. Well, I mean, uh, we've kind of touched upon some of this. Uh, you, there's a lot of computing technology that's going on right now that uh, this artificial intelligence research and for a long time it seemed like the efforts have been to try and create an intelligence a brain in a sort uh, mm-hmm. that's human like in some way mm-hmm. um, but I'm starting to to think that when we do that it's not going to be a human like intelligence but we're going to be creating some sort of an intelligence Mm -hmm. Uh, that will be based on a different substrate than our physical bodies that we have. And they'll have some similarities because we're kind of initiating the programming for it. Mm -hmm. Um, So I think maybe we touched upon this earlier. So when you get uh, when you get that, does someone in your field (laughs) have anything to say about what those artificial intelligence researchers are doing with with the computing platform? Um, Are they able to? Can you view it as as doing the same? I mean, when you, when you get a computing device mm-hmm. or an artificial intelligence sufficiently complex, mm-hmm. so that it's giving off behaviors of, of human behaviors, right? Would we say that that is? Are like you going to be able to do it? Yeah. Goal. Yeah. Is um, it just a? Be, I guess are you behaviorist as a way of? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't. Like, yeah. The outcome yeah. looks like the way a human would behave, but we don't know what's going on inside the box. Is right? Enough? Isn't this the yeah. same problem yeah, with humans? Say, exactly. How do I know what you that you're conscious? Uh, Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't. I don't know. Um, yeah, I don't know what the what the biggest challenge will be there. It's sort of a question of yeah, can we take a processor and make it? Mm-hmm. Uh, it you know, is the the whole greater than the sum of its parts? Like all mm-hmm. the parts we can imitate, does yeah. that mean that above it all we're going to have this um, conscious experience for mm. the machine? And how would you prove it if yeah. even if you did accomplish that? Um, well, as you said just uh, just a minute ago, I mean, I can't, I can't prove that you're a conscious being, but behaviorally you're exhibiting, uh, you know, that you are. Mm-hmm. Uh, and as a result, just the fact that I can't prove that you are doesn't mean that I withhold any kind of rights from you that are human rights, right? Yeah. So with this AI, if they're going to have uh, behaviors that we can't prove whether or not they're conscious, what right do we have to deny them right. the right of selfhood mm-hmm. if they're behaving like we are and in a sort of mysterious unprovable way like we are yeah it seems like it's going to be a hard argument to to deny them well humans yeah. seem to be able to deny animals <laughs> uh, right i know i'm like humans <laughs> deny other humans the rights that they probably well, yeah. <laughs> should have um i guess we like to think there's uh, such a thing as progress but not necessarily yeah yeah i can mm. i can mm. think of a computer being low down the list <laughs> in yeah. terms of like who's going to get a yeah. uh, proper treatment but yeah mm. it sort of reminded me of that movie what was that movie that joaquin mm. phoenix was in where he has a relationship 
with Joaquin really Phoenix. Oh, her. Scarlett the Johansson movie, her. on his phone. Yeah, yeah. But it's his phone. That's a great movie. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But something about the relationship, maybe because we know it's not another human. You do, you don't. Well, I didn't feel like the the phone was was another was an equal to him, or hmm. was he? Was it? Would it ever be like fulfilling enough to have? Well, I don't know. Uh, I think. I, I think it might be not yeah. because of my own personal experience, but from what I see, like um, I've noted that in places like Japan, mm-hmm. there is a cultural phenomenon in which teenage boys are dating characters oh, pers- of like, yeah. you know, like their avatars or yeah. they're not even avatars. They're, they're artificial uh, game characters. Mm-hmm. And they had this documentary where they were walking around with them and, and uh, you know, these, these, girls come up to them in a little cafe and they brush them away because oh, I'm a, I already have a girlfriend and they show their computer, you know, their, their smartphone or something. Oh, God. So, and also, <laughs> and another aspect of, of humans, uh, which I think is maybe a, a good thing in that uh, something wonderful about us is that if we see anything with kind of a human-like qualities, we, we start to have human-like reactions with them. I mean, uh-huh. people feel for their Roombas, you know, like they yeah. say that if they're, if they get stuck in a corner and they keep going, oh. like, they start yeah, to feel sorry for right. them, you know? So we yeah, kind of empathize with, yeah. uh, and I think uh, we're going to quickly empathize with these, uh, with these kind of yeah. artificial well, intelligences, whatever that means. It comes down to, mm. is that, I mean, to each their own is mm. my sort of philosophy, if that's, you mm. know, does it for you. Um, mm. But uh, there might be more to a relationship than just of course, yeah, conversing. <laughs> or what? Absolutely, but yeah. yeah, but the way I think about it is that there are human relationships that are just conversing. The people are able to have, yeah. you know, uh, you know, com- uh, relationships with people at various different stages of integration, whatever, yeah. whatever that means. So. Yeah, I guess it's something that I'm, I'm kind of thinking about, uh, and, and and I kind of joke that this uh, this podcast is a way to kind of communicate with this future super intelligent being because. <laughs> oh, right. oh, I think I heard this on your po- one of your Did other you? podcasts. Yeah, they're going to analyze one day a supercomputer is yeah. going to be there. It's very likely because if, very, if well, such a yeah. I mean if such a thing will exist, it yeah. will scour all the data from the past. Yeah. That's a given. And, and it'll make models of about everybody. Or suggest what you should do. Maybe. I mean, yeah. Google, and that's the thing. Google is actually at the forefront of this. And they're a commercial enterprise. So they're, you know, they're trying to create a mind, a deep mind that's a super intelligent being that you got to think is going to be, you know, it's not for the purposes of, for the good of humanity. No. <laughs> I know. If Google yeah. gets taken over by, well, yeah, anyway. <laughs> falls into the wrong hands or their, yeah. their corporate um, philosophy mm-hmm. changes, then we could all be in big trouble. Yeah. I will definitely be in big trouble. I've been on yeah. Gmail uh, yeah. user for a very long time <laughs> since it came out. So. Yeah. yeah. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, it's like uh, for years I've been kind of poo-pooing some of my friends who were kind of uh, conspiracy-minded almost, always kind of right. paranoid about things, but it's becoming uh, more and more feasible. Right, you had a things. positive view about it. You're like, I'm waiting. <laughs> Tell me what to do. <laughs> Google, Google <laughs> hive mind no. or whatever. Well, I, I, I'm starting to think that the only way we're going to survive that is actually to mesh with it mm. in a way. Um yeah, I'm kind you know, of going with the flow. I'm yeah. not going to worry too much about it. I don't it think you can stop until it. Until I have mm-hmm. to. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, another, um, since I got somebody who, who, who focuses on the, the mind and the brain, and, and, and I like to ask these questions, but I've been lately thinking about, um, I'm thinking about the conception of myself and the self and self in general as mm-hmm. being kind of um, multiplicity. Mm-hmm. More so. Um, and I know there's a tradition, you know, in the last century, there was a lot of, you know, with, with Freud and uh, you had these uh, unconscious, subconscious, you had the different segments of the uh, the mind. Mm-hmm. Um, do Does that at all get addressed? I mean, because I, I feel like it's making a comeback in the sense that I'm starting to think of different processes within me um, and the abstract layer being just another one of these processes that tends to take predominance and is, is kind of the, um, you know, the, uh, the head, head of the board of directors or whatever. And is, Mm. is, uh, but there's, there's other, what I'm calling cyclones or these activities and processes at play. And sometimes if those, uh, uh, processes, they can grow in strength and kind of take over 
mm-hmm. uh, a prominence in your being. Mm-hmm. Is there a multitude within us? Is it uh, <laughs> like when you're studying a, a subject, uh, you're, you're taking into your it's kind of an assumption that they're a single entity. Well, or are they? I guess so. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you could you can see different researchers um, focusing on particular areas and not paying much attention to. So, for instance, like a memory researcher, and sort of like that central executive or mm. whatever, the top down controller. Mm. Uh, a lot of people like to pretend, well, that has nothing to do with memory, or you know, mm. ignore the role of that process. Um, you know, because I'm a cognitive psychologist, I'll break it down into like different cognitive processes mm. that have different neural substrates to them. And yeah, people tend to study things in their own little domain or they'll start to say, oh, well, this brain area, the, this frontal area is involved also in this. So it must just be a wider network that does this. But mm. instead of thinking about it as like separable processes, if you could find a way um to separate them, you would see that that they are separate. I don't know if that mm-hmm. makes a lot of sense. Yeah. So, like for instance, we give people, you know, and I have a study about this recently. Show, uh, give them a language task, and you can give it to them in a sort of more natural language. Uh, you're just listening to sentences and not having to do anything with them, just processing language, which we can do very easily. Mm-hmm. Versus um, giving them the same sentences, but having them make a pretty simple decision about whether they're grammatical or not. But if you compare the brain networks that are involved in those two different versions of the task, you see that natural natural listening, as we call it, Mm -hmm. involves auditory and language processing regions, Mm -hmm. and that's it. But when you give this slightly not that complicated task, you're seeing all these additional sort of Mm -hmm. top-down executive control networks coming online. Mm -hmm. Um, So that was an example where we were able to separate these things out. But I think that a lot of the time when psychologists study this, Mm -hmm. we use the tasks we use and we like to pretend, well, you know, remembering the instructions and, you know, making a decision and all that stuff will wash away. um, Mm -hmm. And it's not affecting how I think I'm studying this phenomenon, but but it Mm -hmm. actually is, if that makes any sense. Mm -hmm. Or like, you know, yeah. And and, uh, also kind of reminds me of this, uh, when, when the hemispheres are split, sometimes there seems to be evidence of essentially two different entities inside making decisions uh, and and reacting in different ways, depending on, you know, which eye they're looking out of or which hand they're using. They're having totally different processing going on as if they're two different people. Right. You talk yeah. about the old procedure of like severing someone. Yeah, severing corpus the... Callosum that's and then, it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, that's kind yeah, of Yeah, they can. Yeah. It's kind of interesting <clears throat> that they can operate independently. Yeah. Very strange. Um mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, you, there's a lot of duplication. There is specialization in the brain, but there's also a lot of uh, sort of doubling mm-hmm. up on things, right? Um, right? Especially in things like motor control mm-hmm. and vision. We know that those are specifically localized. You know, mm-hmm. the le- left side controls the right side and mm-hmm. vice versa. And also uh, in seeing, right. um, the left side represents the right hemifield so mm-hmm. in space. Um but, yeah, I don't know. Hmm. I don't know if that means that they're always working that way or that is a result of you uh, severing the connection between them. And so now you're seeing something one. artificial. Compensate for it in some sense. But it seems like it does it instantaneously. Like once that split is done, it seems to diverge instantly as if they are able to function. Mm-hmm. It, it kind of lends itself as support for this notion that, I mean, it's sometimes... And, and, I kind of arrived at this through psychedelic research of my mm-hmm. own. So. <laughs> but uh, it, it seems like I could easily buy that notion that there is another um, functioning psyche. I don't know what you call it in mm-hmm. the background. Mm-hmm. That's kind of running that I'm not really having access to. But sometimes when I fall asleep and I dream, that starts to come out and take prominence. And mm-hmm. that subconscious fantasy world of hallucinations essentially is Mm -hmm. just coming out and I'm dreaming and I noticed that when I uh, uh, have been on psychedelic trips that a similar sort of thing is happening it seems to me that the experience is as if I'm given access to the other Mm -hmm. parts that I don't normally have access to unless I'm I'm sleeping Mm -hmm. and dreaming so when I'm having a hallucination it's essentially as if those two realms are colliding and they're kind of uh, um, 
you know, like much like your two eyes are putting together the image to come with a 3D thing. And it seems like I've got these two realms and these two beings that are trying to, uh, normally they're not at odds because one is takes prominence when I'm awake and one takes prominence when I'm asleep. And you can remember those things yeah. later. Yeah. It's, hmm. it's, it's quite fascinating. I don't know if you've done any of your research or seen no. other research uh, of this but no. I think there's a lot of lot to be learned uh, uh, of through those experiences um mm -hmm. there was one uh, i think it was an fmri that was done on someone that was uh in, um, had taken some psilocybin and what mm -hmm. it indicated was that the parts of the brain that aren't normally functioning together for processing information were Mm. that they were more uh connected and more integrated within the different processes so you had as a result Mm. what seemed like an expanded understanding of everything and mm. uh which really coincides with the experience that you're having yeah because it seems like oh you see a lot more that you don't normally see you you notice patterns that you don't normally notice because you're maybe taking into consideration that other side of you that's uh, noticing patterns subconsciously mm -hmm. and it seems like there's a lot of information that's normally there that i'm missing yeah that when you're in that state of mind you see it yeah and being a, you know, a skeptical philosopher uh, for most of my life and, you know, nothing that you can, you know, if you can't point to it, it doesn't, uh, you know, it was very much a scientific uh, approach to everything. Mm -hmm. It's kind of troubling at first yeah. <laughs> to see that, you know, maybe reality is, is to a large extent, not to a large extent, but to a significant extent, there's some arbitrariness to it, uh, uh -huh. that it's not so much a given. Yeah. You're maybe being limited by the amount of information you can. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that idea has definitely been thrown around in, in psychology that, you know, the focus of your attention or your working memory space can only handle so much information. And that might be this mm. sort of incubation idea right. I was talking about earlier that, you mm. know, uh, that maybe it's happening, the, the processing is happening wherever, not mm -hmm. consciously, um, that's allowing you to um, come up with this decision that. Uh, you you can't really get at by trying to do it, you mm. know, in that limited space that you have access to at any given point. Yeah, yeah it almost seems like you're given more hardware to work with. <laughs> then you can handle, yeah. Yeah, then yeah. you can normally handle it. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can handle it for that, uh, you know, mm -hmm. couple of hours that you go through that. Um, but you seem sad about that. Uh, about that which? You, well, that you want to be able to access. You're frustrated by. I not am being, frustrated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and, and and I guess this is kind of where there's a danger of uh, addictive behavior in that sense. That uh, yeah, those experiences are 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 quite wonderful in the sense that you do start to think, oh, I wish I had access to that all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, and and I'm still, I still wonder about this. Is that possible? Or, or I get the sense that maybe the body and the brain would be overwhelmed by it. Or I wonder if you can mm -hmm. train, I mean, how much can the brain take? And can you train it to, 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 to process a lot more than it normally does? If, uh, you know, I know, mm. I wonder about that. And I am sad that we can't have access to that all the time. There seems to be limits, you know, there's, there's these people that have these uh, memories, these really special ability to remember every single detail. Oh, wow. Um, it's a nightmare. They're like su super, <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, <laughs> and but they're miserable. Exactly, they're 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 miserable because maybe there's something adaptive to being able to shut these things out and not access yeah, them all the time. I think so. Um, that you know, if you could remember every single horrible thing and not just you know, chance mm -hmm. upon them every once in a while when you get a reminder of it, but if you were specific in mm. your memory for each exact instance that happened wow. to you, then... It sounds exhausting. It does sound exhausting, yeah. so... But do they just eventually get a new baseline? Um, I mean, in the sense that, speaking of baselines, it... it uh, do you deal with uh, depression and anxiety and that sort of thing uh, in your research? Or, no, no, it's more the cognitive abilities, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but don't you find that that's impacting the cognitive abilities? Uh, what you know, the state of mind that they're in. Um, yeah. So you know. I mean, we we you know, unfortunately, well, mm. what I do, you try to limit yourself to what mm. you'd say were psychologically normal. You know, not currently being treated for mm. um, any major psychiatric disorder or had any neurological disorders in the past. All mm -hmm. these sorts of things are are ruled out so but it almost uh, seems like i keep hearing that uh, so many seniors 
are depressed that it's mm-hmm. almost their natural state of being. <laughs> really? <laughs> I mean, it's like the... I Yeah, the, I find that hard to reconcile with. There's also a literature suggesting that older adults are happier. That's so, interesting. Yeah, who knows? I mean, I think, yeah, it probably depends, I think, on the population. Mm-hmm. Interesting, all the, the work on them being happier all comes out of California. So I don't <laughs> know if it's like a Cal- California happiness Sunshine effect. Or, good yeah. for their arthritis, so they feel better. Yeah, um, <laughs> But no, I think, you know, maybe when you're getting into uh, people who are institutional, you know, who are now in nursing homes or retirement homes or that kind of thing, you, you're looking at something different than when you're, um, yeah, it's funny because we, we talk about older adults, but we I call anybody 65 and over, like, you know, mm. somebody for our city, but there's a big difference between a 65-year-old and an 80-year-old, or there, mm. can, there can be. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I do, I know that instance of uh, depression goes up, but there's also these findings, you know, um, that they report, you know, most older adults, at least who participate in these studies, report being happier. Um, if you get give them a memory task with like sad or mm. upsetting stimuli, like pictures versus happy ones versus neutral ones, and get them to recall them later, older adults recall more of the positive images, mm. whereas young people show this negativity effect, and they'll show better memory for the negative mm. images. So um, there does seem to be this shift in um, focusing on the positive a bit more with age. I guess that's wisdom probably maybe what, what do you want to call it yeah that? the view so is maybe. that they were they're they're motivated to maintain a happy mood so they're sort of like shutting down negative information maybe that isn't relevant to them mm. maybe if you had some information to them that was mm. really you know about their own children or something like that then you might mm-hmm. see a different sort of effect but this is just using like pictures uh, yeah of people they don't know. And I, another thing that I've noticed as I, as I get older is that I'm better able to hack my own mental processes in a sense that you, you start to take more control of, like if I, I make a decision that I want to be happier in the next few months, mm-hmm. I'm going to have to take these steps and, and uh, you know, you start to take these steps and uh, you're able to do it. Yeah, I think that's the view that they're that mm-hmm. they're using control more wisely. You know, yeah. I'm already talking about oh, they've got less control, but right. they they might be using it in a different way, in a motivated way to maintain mm-hmm. a positive aspect uh, affect. Um, mm-hmm. That older people spend less time like seeking out new relationships mm-hmm. like we do when we're young, mm-hmm. because that's they know that that's like emotionally not gonna probably lead anywhere. You know, they right. prioritize so family their resources are drawn to other parts yeah. of the experience. Yeah, to yeah. to try to maintain this positive. Don't sweat the small stuff mm-hmm. as well. And I think that older adults are definitely better at that to not stress about like that's true. I'm in a traffic jam. Yeah, yes, you know. But why do they watch the Weather Network all day? Long? I, I really don't know. Yeah, that's Asking funny. for my parents. I know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I knew the weather was going to be bad that's yesterday. My exactly. dad told me. <laughs> yeah, they called me and said, there's going to be snow yeah. there. Okay, I know. <laughs> yeah. That is fascinating, though. It's, it's almost like, uh, do you find that, uh, see, well, see, that would indicate that they're being somewhat more concerned about their safety. I mean, mm. it seems like uh, th- the way to think about that would be that you're more concerned about things that could go wrong. But the way you were reporting just a minute ago is that they see the positive aspect of things, but um, maybe they're on the lookout more or they, maybe they feel more fragile. Do you get a sense that seniors are feeling less secure about their physical well, safety? I don't know. Possibly. I mean, mm. the people that we see who come to our lab are the kind of people who are willing to mm, come out for the right, day so and a lot of the time you know i've seen people travel by bus you know i think um it's great that um i think participating in cognitive experiments sort of gives them something to do and uh for them you know it's a day out go uh depending on the person mm-hmm. of course but um <clears throat> that fragility i mean i know that somebody said some Somebody in Cambridge when I was there was concerned about the older women in the sample saying like, oh, I can't do that. Hmm. You know, and there was this view of like, oh, I'm not coming to be scanned in an MRI hmm. scanner. But I definitely haven't seen that. And the, the older adults that I tested there were sort of like stoic. They were totally like, yeah, you're, you know, for one of these studies, you had them have them lift their shirt up and the older women were like, yeah, whatever. You know, so, I don't know. It depends on the person maybe. But, yeah, um, that's true. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. I don't know if uh, worrying about their their physical safety. Definitely mm-hmm. worried about their mental mm-hmm. um, ability, and probably because of this stereotype that everything's declining with age, uh, like cognitively. Mm-hmm. Um, that I think that really is a concern to people, and yeah. you can see that that can cause anxiety when they come into the lab. That they're worried about being evaluated in that way. Hmm. I guess another thing that this touches on is that when when that happens, when the cognitive ability fades, they will become more susceptible to being fooled, in some sense. And I guess a lot of the con men, you know, take advantage of this. You see a lot of marketing uh, of you know uh, home repair people going around and and you know essentially mm-hmm. overcharging. And also even Fox News is maybe built on this notion, you know, that mm. uh, people watching it are maybe more. Is it is it true that you're more likely to fall for a con if you're older than you're younger? Is that hmm. is that a cultural difference or is that a cognitive difference? I don't know. Yeah, I don't know what it is, whether it's just because they're being targeted or they mm. know that um, they might have income or hmm. it's a might be isolated. Yeah, I wonder if there's like a particular group that they target uh, with those schemes. Well, one way to think about it is that, you know, if you say that they grew up in the 50s, they might be more trusting because people were just culturally Mm. different then. Mm -hmm. And so they're still applying the old cultural practices to today and they're being, and then people are taking advantage of that. That's one way to look at it. Yeah. Or is it that their cognitive abilities are, you know, affecting their uh, critical thinking? It might be partly that. Um, Mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you know, these con people tailor everything, you know, you might get something saying, oh, your Gmail account, you know, log in to do this. You know, everybody Mm. tries to tailor and young people fall for For those kinds of things. Yeah, Yeah. that's true. They might not fall for somebody phoning and like, well, how'd you get my phone number? You know, but Mm. (laughs) um, Mm. yeah, I think it's it's different, but there might be some cognitive um, issues going on there as well. I'm Mm. not sure. So what what kind of research are you doing right now? What uh, are you doing? Are you working on a research project at the moment uh yep well i'm getting Mm. yeah i'm getting so i just started at brock um january Mm. 1st Mm, so um i'm in the process of getting my own lab up and running um which means things like finding grad students finding undergrad students and yeah Yeah. Mm -hmm. applying for ethics and stuff like that i've got projects i'm tying up um from uh from harvard still Mm. um that's a conference i'm i'll be talking about some work I did there on Monday. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, the the work we're going to be doing, I mean, one of the things um, I'm starting to look at is this notion of, uh, like I was talking about earlier with the language, the sentences of like, you are either listening to language naturally or you're doing it within the context of a task. Mm. Um, but I'd like to take this to the memory domain, which is more where I'm from, okay. and try to study memory when you're trying to remember something versus something just naturally reminds you hmm. of something and trying oh, yeah, to look at... yeah, that seems a very different uh, yeah. process is going on. Yeah, there? and look yeah. at um, age differences in the neural underpinnings of that sort of, you know, voluntary uh, top-down memory versus involuntary hmm. memory. Can you can you say a little bit about the difference between uh, the memory that just comes to you and one that you're trying to recall? What What is the difference and what's happening? Um Okay, well, uh, so this is this work has been studied before with uh, young people. So you know, a lot of a lot of our memories in everyday life are more of the type that you're reminded of, of mm. something. <laughs> Whereas yeah. in cognitive experiments, it's more the kind yeah. of like we're giving you a cue. Um, so uh, one of the paradigms that we're going to be using, we're borrowing uh, from somebody who's done this with young people uh, while scanning them um, using fMRI. Um, so they had people uh, learn these picture sound pairs outside the scanner. So you hear mm. uh, sound of uh, a donkey braying and, and there's like this particular image of a woman riding on, on a donkey. And they have mm. them learn these things outside the scanner and also sounds that aren't paired this might be a bit complicated to get into, but then sure. they go in the scanner, mm-hmm. um, and one group are presented with the sounds and are told to, they're just doing this laterality decision task, deciding mm. whether the sound is louder on the left or on the right. Hmm. And another group, so that's the involuntary memory group. We're not right. being told we care about your memory for the pictures too. Another group is told to do that same task, but also to try to remember the images. So now mm. you've got one group 
um, who's trying to remember the images and another who's not. And you can compare neural activity to these paired sounds versus the unpaired sounds. Hmm. So basically when you do that comparison, you see in both groups activation in visual regions. So the sounds are bringing the pictures to mind. Hmm. And in like memory, medial temporal lobe memory regions, um, versus the control group, the people who are trying to remember, you're also seeing that difference in those visual regions, um, but you're also seeing additional frontal activation, which is mm. uh, sort of the seat of like top-down mm. attentional control. So they're also doing this additional process of like mm. directing memory and trying to bring things to mind or maybe deciding whether they've remembered something or not. But mm. um but it's interesting that you can uh, sort of get at this um, using these kind of paradigm, whereas uh, it would be difficult to do that, to find evidence of remembering something without um, asking somebody explicitly. Hmm. Like I showed you, uh, I played you the sound. How do I know that you remembered it or not? Hmm. But since I can see greater visual activation in, in your brain, Mm -hmm. when it was something that was paired with a, an image, then I know that you are remembering something. So it's one of the uses of fMRI. I can sort of tell what you're thinking about. Hmm. Sort of. <laughs> are fMRIs as uh, difficult and expensive as uh, MRIs? Is it something different? Is it the same technology? It's it's the same scanner. Is it um, readily scanner? available? Yeah. It's the same scanner. It's yeah. a different pulse sequence mm. uh, that they use. So MRI, using it to take an image of just the structure of your brain, uses a different sort of mm -hmm. uh, sequence um, in disturbing the molecules than uh, mm. something used to study uh, functional brain imaging. So it's the same is, scanner. Right. It's the same yeah. scanner. Same scanner. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I was curious about Just that. Just using it in a it slightly seems, different way. Yeah. And they're coming up with all these different sort of the physicists, they, they, mm. the physicists are mm. coming up with different sort of pulse sequences that measure different mm. things. So some people think there's something called spectroscopy, which you can use mm. to measure uh, con concentrations of neurotransmitters in the brain. Um, arterial spin labeling, which is measuring like blood flow, like the amount of blood flow to certain regions in the brain. So mm -hmm. you, depending on how they sort of disturb <laughs> the cells in your body and, yeah. and then and measure them, uh, the, the signals that they send out after you disturb them with the, the pulse, you can measure different things using the same scanner. Hmm. Because that seems like a really fun toy to play with. Uh, yeah, yeah, it is. Yeah, <laughs> <Not so much. laughs> yeah. Some. Uh, um, I, I noticed that. Uh, I wish I could have an fMRI in my house here. <laughs> right. <laughs> Just, I have questions sometimes. Sit around. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, what happens when I'm playing music as opposed to you know? Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's another interesting thing that uh, that came up. Um, with psychedelic use, to be honest, mm -hmm. was that I realized uh, that there was always music playing in the background. Oh, really? Yeah. And that, that it just kind of came clear to me that what I, I had been doing is that um, I'd been basically combining all the sounds that are in the room and turning it into some kind of a music. That it had always been oh, going on. It wasn't like songs that you were familiar no, with. No, just oh, creating okay. it on the fly so that it made sense. Maybe like taking random patterns and trying to find some mm -hmm. kind of a sense to it. And uh, it's odd that after I had this realization, I started making a lot more music, as, as you see around me here. And mm. it's only the last um, you know two or three years where I discovered that there was this process kind of in the background all the time that I just wasn't paying attention to. Mm. But now I have more access to it. Mm -hmm. And uh, and the, the type of music that I do is actually um, not executive level in the sense that I'm. it's all improvised. Mm -hmm. and there's no plan. And everything reacts to, essentially, it's my body and, and unconscious responses to whatever sound is coming i respond to that and it builds a you know mm. kind of oscillating layers of of information that um mm -hmm. uh, that i wasn't aware of that was already happening and it just makes me wonder how much more is going on mm. <laughs> back mm -hmm. there yeah that we don't have access to <laughs> you have to do more psychedelic drugs i guess yeah, well, is the I only end no. <laughs> <laughs> well you can't do too much of that too, yeah so, obviously <laughs> Uh -huh. So what can I expect? I'm going to turn 50 in a couple of months. <laughs> I don't know. 
Should I am I am I supposed to be experiencing a cognitive drop off at this stage? Or is it in the sixties, seventies? When does it uh, when is it typical? Um, well, yeah, we were saying earlier that it might start as early as the twenties, right. um, but depends on um, the ability you're mm -hmm. talking about, right? And yeah. that these effects that you know I was talking about also might be exaggerated. You know, I mm -hmm. I, I can't really tell you where you're going because I haven't yeah. measured you five <laughs> five years ago to right. establish a sort of trajectory mm -hmm. um, in you longitudinally instead right. of just comparing you. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to compare you to like a a young person. Mm -hmm. I mean that you might do worse than them, right. but. Um, compared to yourself as a young person, maybe you're not doing right. worse. Mm -hmm. um, I don't, you know, I don't think there's anything to start worrying about no. <laughs> in terms <laughs> of aging. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, but you know, keep doing the things that uh, we know um, might help prevent decline, which are exercise um, mm -hmm. and staying cognitively active, I think are the main yeah. Um, things. I don't think any of these brain training uh, yeah. things hold great promise. Mm -hmm. um, basically, most of the research shows that you get really good at the game and right. it's yeah. not going to transfer to your uh, other. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's uh, another thing I'm noticing as, I, as I'm getting older is that um, maybe I'm developing a different kind of intelligence, which might be more labeled emotional intelligence. Mm -hmm. um, is that sort of thing researched uh, in your realm of, of studies is that uh, is there I don't even know if you can quantify that but yeah I mean well that sort of relates to that work <laughs> I was talking about earlier where that they're maintain uh, motivated to maintain a positive mood but there is mm. some work suggesting yeah that emotional control mm -hmm. um, that sort of thing emotion regulation some people do study that um, empathy maybe uh, does I don't that know change about empathy mm. um, but I do know that you know, the control of your emotions mm. tends to stay the same mm. um, as you age. Um, really, yeah? Yeah. Uh, although it depends on who you ask and probably mm -hmm. depends on... But, you know, um, this work showing that, you know, that older adults are in a better mood on average. Not everybody um, mm. sort of fits with that. That um, emotionally, you probably will do better. <laughs> rather yeah. than worse as, as you get older, depending on the, on the situation. Yeah. yeah. Mm. But it can also mean that you have a rosy outlook or mm. avoid negative information, which could mm. be problematic in, in mm. some ways. You know, if I, uh, I know the example in the, in the United States is sitting down and having to look at, um, uh, different medical plans mm. everything's very complicated there in terms of like choosing your insurance provider and stuff mm -hmm. and some of it is you know could be negative or upsetting and um we don't want older adults sort of turning away from that kind of thing to oh, to, oh i'd rather play with my grandkids you know mm. um yeah great well yeah. <laughs> thank you very much for the conversation oh thanks for having me that was great very nice we do to a, meet you. a high five at oh, the end high five sure <laughs> 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 Thanks very much, Karen. Thank you. Well, do study consciousness is really hard. It's a hard problem, right? So, well, do study consciousness is really hard. Auto no hard problem. Consciousness so, that allows you to sort of like really auto no hard problem. Consciousness that allows you to sort of like really auto no hard problem. Consciousness that allows you to sort of like really auto no hard problem. As your frontal lobe, maybe, I mean, maybe, I mean, we, you know, I think maybe, I mean, maybe, I mean, maybe, I mean, I've implanted this, I've implanted this, I've implanted this, I've implanted this idea in your head at one given point in time. You are taking in more information than you could ever consciously process at one given point in time. You are taking in more information uh, than yourself, you could uh, ever project consciously yourself, uh, project yourself in the future, in the future, project yourself in the future, 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 it's almost that way that I've implanted this idea in your head. It's almost that way that I've implanted this idea in your head.
your head. That I've implanted this, that I've implanted this, that I've implanted this idea in your head. Really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. not really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. not really hard. Auto no hard problem. Consciousness. Right? Really hard. Auto no hard problem. Consciousness. Right? Really hard. Auto no hard problem. Consciousness. In the future, into the past, re experience things. Ima- uh, project yourself in the future, and in the future, and in the future, and in the future, and in the future, into the past, re experience things. Ima- uh, project yourself. Auto noetic consciousness. Auto noetic consciousness. That allows you to sort of like auto noetic consciousness that allows you to sort of like auto noetic consciousness that allows you to sort of like in the future and in the future and in the future and in the future and auto noetic consciousness that allows you to sort of like you get better and you get better and you get better as your frontal lobe usually focus on something. And maybe as you start up in the future, you might start to lose some future, of the future. Maybe, I mean, in the future, and the maybe, future, I mean, in the future, and it's, it's almost that way that I've, impl- I've implanted this idea in your head. Maybe, I mean, uh, we, maybe, I mean, uh, we, maybe, I mean, I've implanted this, I've implanted this idea. Maybe, in your I mean, head. processing of information that, processing of information that, that we aren't aware of. Really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. really hard. It's the hard problem, right? It's yeah. really hard. I know hard problem. Consciousness so that allows you to sort of like really hard. It's really hard. It's hard problem, right? So we'll do study consciousness. Really hard. I know hard problem. Consciousness that allows you to sort of like in the future and the past. Really hard. I know hard problem. Consciousness in the future and the past. Really hard. I know hard problem. Consciousness in the future and the past. Really hard. I know hard problem. Consciousness in the future and the future. Auto noetic consciousness that allows you to sort of like uh, project yourself in the future into the past, re experience things, and ima- uh, project yourself in the future into the past, re experience things, and ima- really hard. It's the hard problem, right? So, we'll do study consciousness, it's really hard. It's the hard problem, right? So, we'll do study consciousness, it's really hard. It's the hard problem, right? So, we'll do study consciousness, it's